We're in uh, Matthew chapter 7. It, it really just dawned on me uh, this morning that today we're going to conclude two series. We're going to conclude our series on the Sermon on the Mount. You may be thinking at long last. Uh, but Dan is uh, con- uh, finishing his uh, series in Joshua. And I'll let him uh, reveal what's coming up next. But next for us, for me anyway, is uh, the Gospel of Luke. I've never, you know how us teachers do it. We find something we haven't done before. That's what we want to teach. So uh, we'll begin that, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks. Uh, when Mike is going to finish Proverbs, will the Lord come first? <laughs> I know he peeks in on this every now and then, so just, just kidding, Mike. Uh, but uh, it's Matthew chapter 7, the conclusion of our study. It, uh, there's only a very short passage uh, remaining, beginning in the 24th verse. And I want to read it right at the start so that it'll be at the forefront of our minds as I make a few preliminary observations about the sermon as a whole. Uh, the Lord has just remember, issued the somber warning against a false profession of faith in him. In verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. His pretend followers will protest on that day. Uh, Didn't we prophesy Uh, Didn't we cast out demons and perform miracles? Weren't we church people? We checked the box, uh, Christian, on the many endeavors of our lives. But Jesus will declare, I never knew you. This is verse 23. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Their profession does not correspond to the reality of, of their conduct. And so in verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, and I just want to pause right there to point out something to you. There's a word that's used, maybe it's in the margin of your Bible, uh, acts on them or does them. It's the same word he used up in verse 21, so let your Eyes wander up to 21 where Jesus said, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. And that's the same word as here. He he who does them, he who acts on them. It's also the same word in verse 26. We're going to read that in a, a second. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, does not do them, is is what he's saying. Same word. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Well, you remember as the Lord approached the end of the sermon, he insisted that there were only two gates and one can choose to enter in either of those two gates in this earthly sojourn, one leading to life, the other leading to destruction. At times, the choice a person makes may appear indistinguishable from another's. That is, a person may actually have chosen to go in the direction of the Broadway that leads to destruction while appearing like others who have chosen the narrow way leading to life. But you can't necessarily tell a book by its cover. Uh, The Lord seems to be saying the the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, 
if you don't mind me using two old adages uh, in a row. He goes on in verses 17 through 20, like two similar looking but different trees. The fruit they produce will reveal what kind of tree each is, and that will become apparent on the day of judgment when the claims each makes are revealed to be empty or real. So he has identified the two ways, the two gates, the two trees, and two claims, and now the Lord concludes by pointing his listeners to the two completely different foundations upon which to build one's life. Remember uh, Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount began in the first verse of chapter 5. And I don't think his introductory words there were just a, a throwaway line. He wrote that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he began to teach them. He saw the crowds. There were massive crowds of people attracted to this man who so captivated their attention. And now his sermon would serve as a mirror in which the crowds could identify who they really were and what their relationship to him truly was. And as we ponder the completion of the sermon, we are confronted with the great tragedy of empty profession, of mere dalliance with the truths of the gospel. And we're reminded of Satan's perpetual modus operandi of undermining the veracity of God's word. Has God really said? Nothing could be more devilish than to promote the completely false narrative that there are many divergent paths that lead to God and therefore to heaven. And closely connected is the popular thought that truth is relative. Uh, contradictory propositions can both be true in some sense. That is an affront to the dignity of man and to reason, not to mention man's creator. Our own conscience testifies to us that what is true is true and what is false is false. And to claim otherwise is to contradict reason. And what really is behind such philosophies are either the inability to comprehend what is true or the unwillingness to accept what is true. One concerns the mind of a person, which is finite and limited, and therefore in need of external aid or external illumination. That speaks to man's inability. The other concerns the will of man, which is contaminated by sin. We call that depravity, making it constitutionally opposed to accepting the truth. Yet Jesus is so bold that he contends, he not only contends, but he insists that there are only two options set forth in his typically plain spoken way as two paths or gates, two trees, two claims to reality. How foolish then, the Lord now says, using the colorful figurative language of the construction of one's home, one's castle, if you will, to build it upon the foundation of the shifting sands of empty profession. And how wise for one to build it on the foundation of the solid rock of truth. So the wise man builds but what is the foundation to which the Lord refers uh, the rock? The Super Bowl was just a few uh, weeks ago. It was the Kansas City Chiefs with their precocious young quarterback phenom Patrick Mahomes versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and their future Hall of Famer Tom Brady. I was rooting for the Chiefs. That goes back to reasons that have to do with my childhood and the origin of that team here as the Dallas Texans. But I wasn't too disappointed uh, to see one of the truly great athletic performances by this 42-year-old Tom Brady. He's kind of like Nick Saban to me. I'm always rooting against him, but I really admire him. <laughs> 
Uh, Brady has played in 10 Super Bowls. He's won seven. He's been the most valuable player in five Super Bowls. The last one came after he left New England and went to Tampa Bay with a new coach, a new system, a new team, new teammates, very same result. He's followed a regimen of diet and physical fitness that has contributed to his accomplishments. He's considered to be a generally upright citizen with only a few blemishes. Uh, shortly after the game, I read an interview with one of his close advisors who was asked, what is the secret of his success? And he pointed to Brady's complete dedication to the two things that are important to him, football and family. And that's something refreshing against how some of these professional athletes live their lives. And it's not my purpose to be critical of Tom Brady. As I say, there's much to admire about him, but he's a public figure. And so I say this only by way of illustration, that if those should prove to be the only two things, and I'm not saying they are, but if they should prove to be the only two things as admirable as they are that are the focus of his attention, then he or anyone like him has missed the most important object of one's life pursuits. There is a greater end to live for, what has been called man's chief end. And you know how the famous catechism uh, describes it. It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Or, as presented to us in the Sermon on the Mount, it is to build our house on the rock by doing the will of our Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to further define what those two aspirations really mean, the rock and doing the will of God. But first, I'd like us to consider a short phrase out of the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. You might want to turn there. Uh, consider this something of an excursus in our lesson. This phrase is found in Romans 1 verse 5, where the apostle states that he was granted to be an apostle. That's how he spoke of himself, that his apostleship was a gift. And he says he was granted to be an apostle in order to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. And that's the phrase, the obedience of faith. Now, there's some difference of opinion whether by that he meant faith itself as an act of obedience or faith that issues in obedience. Uh, both are true to some extent. First, we're commanded in the scriptures to believe in Christ, to have faith in Christ. He is the rightful object of saving faith. So to believe in him is to exhibit the obedience of faith in that sense. But two things are clear, or at least they ought to be, in Jesus' illustration. One is that Christ himself is the rock. In the context, that's clearly what he meant. And his 12 disciples, soon to be his apostles, were beginning to grasp that as well. There's that scene in Matthew 16 at Caesarea Philippi where Jesus had asked his disciples, who, do, who are people saying that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter eagerly uh, blurted out his answer, you are the Christ, uh, the Son of the living God. And Jesus pronounced him blessed for that profession and said, upon that rock, that self-same confession that Jesus was the long-promised Messiah and Son of God, he would build his church and the gates of Hades would not overpower it. Years later, in their role as apostles, Peter and Paul would both affirm the same. Uh, Peter uh, would boldly stare down his enemies in the Sanhedrin and declare that Jesus of Nazareth, uh, quoting from Psalm 118, was the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which it, but which has become the chief cornerstone. And, 
He went on to say, and there is salvation in no, uh, no one else. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. So that's a foundation that cannot be demolished. Uh, Paul would make a similar point in Romans 9, 32. He was addressing himself to Jewish unbelief. And he very well could have used the same figure of speech of the house built on the foundation of sand that Jesus used, but instead uh, he quoted from Isaiah 28. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So uh, Peter and uh, Paul both knew that the, what the rock was, a, was upon which to build a castle of faith and salvation. The other thing that is true and ought to be clear is that truth, faith does issue in obedience. Faith and trust in Christ alone being the starting point of that obedience. That is obedience of faith in the sense that obedience will be the inevitable consequence of faith. As I said, interpreters uh, differ on what Paul intended, uh, whether it was faith as the object of obedience or obedience as the companion of true faith. But the wise man, <clears throat> we can say, getting back to Jesus' actual words in the sermon and also noting what has just preceded this about doing the will of the Father and now acting on Jesus' words, the wise man has erected a foundation for his eternal desti destiny upon exclusive trust in Jesus as the rock that will never fail him, and that will be reflected in the subsequent conduct of his life, manifesting the reality of his faith in obedience to Christ's commands. He has anchored his life, his aspirations and priorities, and his future on Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It is no empty profession, but the consistent and evident fruit of his conduct. He is a wise person. But then sadly, there is uh, the foolish man. He, has he is contrasted to the wise man in two ways. In the prior verses, it was in the contradiction between what he said and what he did. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only he who does the will of God will enter. The implication is he said, but he did not do. Now, however, the contrast is between hearing and doing. One hears and acts. The other hears Christ's words but does not act. So Jesus is drawing the sermon to a close. You know what that's like. Uh, this is the preacher's conclusion, and it, it comes in the form of a somber warning to the multitudes who had gathered themselves around him, and they had begun in their minds perhaps to identify themselves as his followers. And Jesus is now insisting while, that while it's essential that they understand who he is, of course, and that they give verbal profession of their allegiance to him, that's necessary also. But either one of those are but empty claims if they're not accompanied by the measure of obedience which will identify him as his followers far more transparently than words alone. It's clearly not that Jesus suggests the path to salvation or, or borrowing his uh, words in verse 21, the way to enter the kingdom of heaven is by virtue of one's good works of obedience. That cannot be true. Otherwise, it would contradict the entire New Testament teaching that salvation is not by works, but by grace 
alone. Here we've got a little preaching to the choir going on, I know, but it's important to say this. Uh, both Jesus and the apostles taught that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. But saving faith is revealed in that it does not stand alone. It inevitably issues in the fruit of good works. That was the message of much of the book of James, uh, who told us that faith without works is dead. And you'll forgive me, I know, for repeating myself, but the Apostle Paul made that very point in the passage that is perhaps his clearest expression of the faith alone way of salvation. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, where he insists that it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. But he doesn't just let it go at that. You remember verse 10, he continues, we're his workmanship, God's workmanship. Think about that. We are a, a, a piece of work of which God is the author, the artist, the creator. It's his work. We are his workmanship being created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God created beforehand that we would walk in them, that we should walk in them. Paul could not have been clearer that he believed a true experience of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone would never exist in a vacuum, but would always constitutionally possess also the very works that God himself made part and parcel of the supernatural work. And let, me, let me just add to that. And likewise, the apostle John, uh, he testified that he was in agreement with Paul and also with James when he wrote in 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. There again is, is Jesus' contrast between what one says and what one does. If we say one thing but then act in another way, we lie. But John is only recalling the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus spoke of fruit. John substitute the manner of one's life, how he walks. That's the Greek peripateo. It's the bent of our life. Uh, Jesus said you'll know them by your, their fruits. John said you'll know them by the bent of their lives. But Jesus here is issuing a warning to the multitudes against a foundation that will not stand. Like the field that had both the wheat and the tares uh, in it. This crowd consisted of people who by appearance all looked the same. Uh, using Jesus' figure, they were, they were rows of houses that, uh, from the street, as you drove down the street. Uh, all these houses uh, looked the same. There were little visible distinctions, but they were there. The distinctions were there. Call it what you will. Empty profession, blind presumption. Of course I'm a Christian. I live in America. I grew up going to church. Mindless aversion to truth. We'll talk about that some other time. Or the grossly inflated hubris of self-perception. I'm a good person. Whatever those distinctions were, some had built their house on a foundation of sand, others on the rock. It's when the storm that will surely come arrives that these two foundations are revealed for what they are. So Jesus repeats again in verse 27, the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. This is not a storm of affliction that the Lord warns against. It's true that as we proceed through the different phases, periods of our lives, we'll inevitably encounter various trials, 
some severe like a storm, and they will to some degree reveal what we're made of and how strong our faith is. God uses them to discipline us and strengthen us and to teach us uh, to trust more fully in Him. But in the Old Testament, uh, storms were often pictures of the judgment that God brings. Just using Ezekiel 13 as, as one illustration, the Lord there condemns the falsehoods and pretensions by which the prophets had misled God's people, and he compares them to this fragile wall uh, that they have plastered over with whitewash. And, and then he warns them, uh, a flooding rain will come, and, and hailstones, and a violent wind. They're an extension of God's wrath. It's no random storm, but the Lord says, I will tear down the wall which you have plastered over with whitewash and bring it to the ground. And when it falls, you will be consumed in its midst. That's God's judgment. Now notice in Jesus' illustration, just two verses uh, prior here in verse 25, the, the very same time of judgment that comes upon the foolish man will come upon the wise man, the, the rain and the floods and the winds, and yet his house did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. We had quite a winter storm that passed through here uh, just three weeks or so ago. I'm not using this storm to illustrate this one in our passage, but we can, can use it to demonstrate that the effects of storms are not the same on everyone. Some lost power and, and, and consequently uh, warmth and freezing to death, and they had pipes break, and they were in want of water, water and they were just generally uh, miserable. Uh, but some experienced no effects from the storm at all. It was, it was all snowman making and sledding and a welcome break from, from work. As Jesus draws his sermon to a close, he is emphasizing and warning against the great threat the coming storm will bring. He's painting a vivid and awful and foreboding picture intended to instill fear in his listeners. Look, beginning in, in, in verse 13, first there's destruction. And then a raging fire in, in verse 19. A forceful rejection of the disobedient in verse 23. And now here, for the person who hears the words of Christ but does not act upon them, a tornado-like storm that flattens his house and sweeps it away. Don Carson, in his commentary, asked the obvious question, is Jesus trying to frighten people into the kingdom? Well, to some degree, he is. The answer is yes. There are many impulses that lead people to choose the narrow way and trust Christ and enter into the kingdom of heaven. It may be a deep sense of guilt and the need for forgiveness or the warmth of feeling in the face of God's love or even a, a rational consideration of the facts and the merits of the message of the Word of God. But some are rightly frightened there as the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and warns of condemnation and hell. It's never been a popular thing to speak of hell, for if hell exists and promises the kind of misery and punishment that the Bible describes, it will inevitably be an uncomfortable a topic and one to avoid. We don't relish in our lives talking about hell with people that we're not that familiar with. It's no wonder the unbelieving world prefers to make a comedy routine out of hell. But Jesus spoke of hell often, more than any of the other figures in the scriptures. And now as he concludes the Sermon on the Mount, he forcefully voices the urgent warning. One day the rain will fall. The floods will come. The winds will blow and slam against your house. And if you have not the foundation of Jesus Christ, 
your fall will be hellish. Well, it's unlikely uh, that any uh, there that day listening to Jesus say these things failed to understand it. For various reasons, many we know would refuse to heed it, but that he had made himself clear is almost certain. The sermon over, Matthew now in the concluding verses of chapter 7 reports on their reaction. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Jesus was no mere teacher. Uh, the scribes of his day taught derivatively. Their expertise was in what others before them had taught or said. We might say that their words were riddled with footnotes. But Jesus was not another scribal authority well-educated and able to stitch together a, a decent discourse. He taught by his own authority, a, a supernatural dispenser of truth that shut the mouths of all those opposed. Matthew says that the people were amazed at his teaching. He, he was continually amazing people, astonishing them. I was thinking about this yesterday in my daily Bible reading. I had come to that passage in Mark 11 in which the Lord cleansed the, the temple and the chief priests and the scribes were so angry and they wanted to find a way to destroy him, but they were afraid of him because as Mark recorded, the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. It's the same verb as here, but, but not the only one used by the gospel writers to portray the wonder that people experienced when Jesus spoke, when he taught. I counted something like 13 times that the gospel writers used this particular verb to describe the hearer's re reaction to Jesus' teaching. I didn't bother to count the other descriptive terms, but I was thinking, are we ever amazed at anybody today? Impress, perhaps. I'm impressed with somebody who can write really well. Uh, they, they just have a way with words, and they have a way of telling a story, and a pretty, but you're just page after page after page, and you, you don't want to put it down. I'm in, impressed with someone like that. But is there anybody in the world that truly astonishes us? And yet the Lord has just told this group of people essentially that if you don't believe and act on what I'm telling you, you're going to hell. And they were amazed, for he taught as one having authority. Well, I know it's taken us some weeks uh, to study our sermon uh, but for the people who heard Jesus speak this day, they had only just before heard him rattle off that series of, of bold pronouncements. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. You have heard that the ancients were told, but I say to you. They had just witnessed the audacity of a man who dared define for them what the blessing of God truly looked like. God's blessing had nothing to do with money or fame or power or position. Uh, Jesus insisted that the blessed were those to whom their own spiritual poverty had been revealed and, and who mourned over their sin and who could not be insulted because they knew they deserve, deserved far worse. The blessing of God was manifest in a thirst for righteousness and, and purity and peace. And the poor in spirit would be identified as those who showed mercy to others because they had received mercy from God. Jesus showed them that this form of God's blessing was the entrance into the kingdom of God. He identified the behavior of the citizens of God's kingdom and how their influence in this dark and rotting world would be like 
light and salt, illuminating the darkness of this sinful world and preserving all that was good and all that was dignified about God's creation and man made in the image of God. They had been encouraged to ambition and treasure seeking, but of a wholly different variety than customary. A follower of Jesus would be someone who found meaning not in the approval of the world, but, but by living their lives in the very presence of God, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, and therefore laying up their treasure in heaven and not here on earth where nothing lasts for long. You don't even have your coat from two years ago. It's out of fashion. With such authoritative command, Jesus demanded from his listeners the impossible. It was a call to a righteousness they did not have. Every good tree bears good fruit, he said, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Well, the issue is that left alone, there are no good trees, only bad trees. So the sermon teaches us that what one manifests on the outside, the, the fruit a person produces, in other words, is entirely dependent on the sap that is flowing on the inside. Make the tree good, Jesus said, and then its fruit will be good. Well, we must not interpret the sermon apart from its context in the gospel as a whole. And Matthew uh, began his gospel with uh, something we're all so familiar with, this pronouncement that governs the entire book. Chapter 1, verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus said, come, follow me. He said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Uh, the lessons of the sermon are many. But the fundamental purpose is to invite sinners to choose Christ. There is an antidote to the despair that this world is filled with. Enter through the narrow gate. It leads to life, not destruction. As for me, this unknown hymn writer expressed it, I believe in the love of God. It is an orphan's wildest dream. It is a narrow little road. It's an ever-widening stream. Oh, I will leave this road for the narrow. The love of God is the hymn of hope. Let the needy join the throng. Let the widow hear and cope. Let the crippled rise to sing this song. Oh, I will leave this road for the narrow. The church is the body of Christ. It's a, a great treat to get to stand before the church and see the, the body of, of Christ. That's the figure that the scriptures use to describe the church, but I think we can also say that Jesus saw it as the company of the blessed who found one another uh, walking together on the narrow way that leads to his kingdom. Isn't it a wonderful thing? As I look upon this room, I have no doubt that every one of us is linked in arms on the narrow way uh, headed to the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, for that. We're so grateful for this sermon, which is um, inspiring. It's more than inspiring. It is revealing of uh, who we are, but most of all, of the great grace that you have shown us in sending your son. He was the, the preacher. Uh, they called his name Jesus. He was a baby. He grew up. He went about doing good. He came to the realization of who he was. He never sinned. 
He lived a perfect life. He always did your will. He never said anything that you had not given him to say. And so we see these words as your words through him. And we give you thanks, Lord, that you have created in us uh, the faith to believe them and walk in them. Lord, may we be faithful witnesses to the truths that are here. And may we, as the sermon has, has exhorted us, uh, not just be hearers, uh, but doers of your word. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.